Welcome to Strategy Saturday. I'm Charles Crillo, and today we're going to be discussing why is real estate a great inflation hedge? So if you turned on any news lately, especially financial news, it's you hear every day about inflation. When is inflation going to start picking up more? We've already seen the beginning of inflation. So I want to do a podcast episode on just real estate inflation and how it coincides with real estate. Uh, number one, why hard assets and specifically commercial real estate are good inflation hedges. How well different types of real estate has historically stood up against inflation. And number three, how to best manage your real estate to boost returns during inflationary periods. I also want to do a little background on the CPI, uh, Consumer Price Index, because a lot of people don't understand what's included in that basket. So why hard assets, specifically commercial real estate, are good inflation hedges? Well, hard assets, when we talk about them, it's precious metals, it's commodities, it's natural resources, so your water, your energy, and then also real estate. The value of all these hard assets, including real estate in particular, is primarily derived from limited supply, scarcity, and tangible nature. They exist in a physical form. As inflation occurs, whether it's due to genuine economic growth or, as is most likely the case, monetary debasement, and the price of everything scarce rises, so too do hard assets. Now, land and physical building structures both match this description. So how does inflation affect real estate? Well, three different ways. Number one, property prices increase. We've already seen that. Number two, the cost of debt increases. We have not seen that yet. And number three, rental rates increase. Now, rental rates and property prices usually coincide and ride off of one, other, one another. So that's it's normal to see that. The cost of debt, though, we have not seen that. And that will be something that gets put into place uh, by the Fed to slow down inflation if we get to that point. Who knows if that will even happen. So how well do different types of real estate historically stand up against inflation? Now, I f during our research, I found a very interesting article. I'll link to it. It's a historical MIT study. And the observation is that only retail property income has been proven to keep up with inflation. Industrial and apartment income provide a partial inflation hedge, while office property income provides virtually no inflation hedge. Now, within this study, as you're reading about it, you go, why, why would retail property... Uh, keep up with inflation best out of all the different commercial real estate classes. And that's most likely due to percentage rent leases. Now, if you don't know what a percentage rent lease is, a percentage lease is a lease that requires a commercial space tenant to pay a base rent, and on top of that, to pay the landlord a percentage that is based on business owners' monthly sales volumes. Percentage leases are commonly executed in retail mall outlets and are usually about 7%. So how does that work? Well, if you were in one of these situations with a percentage lease and you had a, say, $1,000 a month lease, and in that $1,000 a month lease, what happened was that uh, that was your base rent, and then you paid, let's say, 7% on top of that. You had $10,000 worth of sales for that month. You would then be paying $700 on top of the $1,000 to your landlord. So in simple terms, this makes perfect sense why it would hold up best, because that landlord's rent being paid to them is re being recalculated every month. So if that most likely in a, a business setting, if you're buying goods and you're buying goods last year for or last month for $1,000 and this month they cost uh, 1,010 and then next month it's uh, 1,050 or whatever it might be, it's increasing, you're most likely gonna increase your prices. When you increase your prices, you're most likely gonna increase the total sales. So you were doing 10,000 uh, this month and three months or four months from now, you're now doing $11,000 a month. Well, now that landlord is being paid 7% on $11,000, not 7% on 10,000. So it's a very, it's a very uh, regular increase in recalculation on the rent that's being paid to that landlord. And that is not normal with office leases. Now, office leases would be typically uh, 15% every five years, so about 3% a year, uh, let's just say that. And if there's any type of, um, let's say, hyperinflation, I don't want to say that, but uh, you know, a great increase in inflation during that time, you can see how that property is not going to hold up with inflation because it might be several years before that landlord is has the ability of renegotiating uh, a new lease. Now, with apartment income, this is something where usually it's done on a 12-month period. So with that being said, it's much easier 
to increase your rents with inflation every 12 months. Not as nice as every month, like with a retail percentage lease, but every 12 months will allow your property to, to hedge inflation. However, with that being said, the real appreciation rate of U.S. real estate in general has been consistently higher than inflation for the past decade. So that's great. A MASH Advisor article, which I'll put into the show notes, talks about how over uh, the last decade, we've seen real appreciation of U.S. real estate uh, outperform the inflation uh, as well. So that's a great thing to know as well. And that's why it's a great hedge. Now, how do you best manage your real estate to boost returns during inflationary periods? Some possible options include introducing periodic uh, rent reviews, maybe semi-annually, or perhaps even quarterly if a commercial property. Now, you'd have to have the tenants agree to this, but these are all ideas. With residential real estate, as we spoke about before, the one-year leases are typical and allow managers to reprice units at market rates. It is typical, though, with residential managers to obtain a partial increase in market rents when renewing good tenants. For example, uh, last year it was $1,000 a month for rent. The market is now 1100 You raise it to 1050 a 5% increase versus a 10% increase because you want to keep that tenant. Because there might other, there, it's very normal that there's other landlords that aren't as good managers of you. They might just be uh, letting people renew at uh, zero increase, 3% increase. So you want to be competitive because you have to always put into consideration, I'm going to get an extra $600 a year in rent when I increase it 10% versus 5%. However, if this unit is vacant for one month, and then if it's vacant for that one month, and I have to do, let's say, one more month worth of work to it, well, that's thousands of dollars that I'll be out just to try to get this extra $50 a month. When the person moves out and we and you do a turn on it, right, and a make ready on the unit and you release it, that's when you can really capture the full market rate. But it's uh, definitely done to do a slight increase with good tenants, obviously. It's good tenants being the operative term there, uh, where you're able to keep them while also capturing some of the market increase in, uh, in, in the rent. Now, also with that being said, just because you're the rent goes up 5% or 10% doesn't mean all your expenses are going to go up that high. You know, you're going to have obviously a lot of your debts going to be fixed, uh, but you might have some other expenses, say uh, operating expenses, but you know, have insurance. These are going to go up, but it's a small percentage of what you're paying on your overall operating costs because the largest percentage is really your debt. Now, if you introduce a rental lease, like a CPI indexation, or another similar index, but a more accurate index, as such clauses were common in rental leases in the high inflationary periods of the 1970s and 1980s, this is more prevalent with commercial leases in extreme inflationary periods. And, you know, inflation in 1980 was 14.76%. This is not something you're going to be getting in a residential lease. But if we really start seeing consistent uh inflationary, maybe extreme inflation, you'll probably see some of these clauses come back. Now, what else can you do? You can pay down any existing property related debt if you have a variable debt and steer clear of new debt because uh, as inflation, it also increases the cost of borrowing. Or if you know, if you've been listening to the show, you know that I really am a big fan of fixed debt. If you have fixed long-term debt in your property, you can weather almost any storm, including inflation. And now, uh, if you're getting debt for 3% and say inflation goes to 6%, I mean, every time, every month you pay your your mortgage, you are, I mean, you're paying with dollars that are cheaper, that are worth less month two than m month one. And that goes for year five, right? Much cheaper dollars than it was uh, year one. Now, a little background on CPI as we wrap up here. The CPI, the Consumer Price Index, was initiated during World War I and reflected the relative importance of goods and services purchased in 92 different industrial centers in 1917 to 1919, particularly in shipbuilding centers, and it made an essential an index essential for calculating cost of living adjustments in wages. In January 1983, housing prices were replaced with owner's equivalent of rent. Now, this is part of the CPI. So pre-January 1983 is actually housing prices were in the CPI, 
And as of January 1983, housing prices were replaced with owners equivalent of rent because rents are more stable and because housing prices rose and fell more than rents during the housing bubble and crash, housing effects on inflation and deflation are not reflected in the CPI. So it's very important to know that. There's 85,000 items in the CPI, 22,000 stores, and 35,000 rental units are added together and averaged. They are weighted this way. Housing, 41.4%. Food and beverage, 17.4%. Transport, 17%. Medical care, 6.9%. Apparel, 6%. Entertainment, 4.4%. And other, 6.9%. So it's very important that housing, 41.4%. That's how important housing is and how it's uh, viewed by economists and how important it is to inflation in our economy. So I'll put all the links to the show notes. Thank you so much for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, submit comments and potential show topics at globalinvestorspodcast.com. Look forward to two more episodes next week. See you then. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Syndication Superstars, LLC, exclusively.